Good morning and welcome once more to worship from Tillicoutry Parish Church. We come from scattered lives to this time of sanctuary to seek our unity in the Holy Spirit, to seek the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, to seek the peace of God our Father. God's people have gathered. Let's worship him together. Let us pray. God our Father, your love is at work in all that you have made. Son of God, in your likeness we are made new. Holy Spirit, you touch our lives with hope. Receive our worship. Claim us for your service. Set us free to honour you today. Holy God, live, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men and women through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We've belittled your, tr- your love and betrayed your trust. We are sorry. We are ashamed. We repent of our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Jesus died and rose again for you. In humble penitence, accept his pardon, receive his peace. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from you alone come everlasting joy and peace. Fill us with joy in your promises and send us out to be bearers of your peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God, first of all from Genesis chapter 37, reading the first uh, verses 2 to 4 and 12 to 28. This is the account of Jacob's family line. 
Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilahand, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and they couldn't speak a kind word to him. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem and Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring back word to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? They moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go on to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and he found them near Dothan, but they saw him from a distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, And they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. And then in the New Testament, we read in Romans chapter 10, verses 5 to 15. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and on your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? 
as it is written. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, here we are. Last week, we were thinking about Abraham, his obedience to God and the birth of his son Isaac. We recalled how even when God asked the hardest thing imaginable, the sacrifice of his son, Abraham was still willing to trust God and God in turn demonstrated that he was worthy of that trust. Abraham was a righteous man. Today we've jumped a couple of generations to encounter Abraham's great-grandsons, including Joseph. Let's just take a moment to remember where they've come from. Abraham's son Isaac had two boys, Esau, who was the eldest, And Jacob. Jacob was his mother's favourite. 
And as the boys were growing up, Jacob had become aware that he wasn't his father's heir because Esau was oldest and so he would inherit. That angered Jacob. And as the years passed, the wound festered until when his father was dying, his mother colluded with him to convince Isaac that in fact Jacob was Esau and that he merited receiving the birthright there and then. And the old man, unable to see, was convinced and handed Israel over to the wrong son. Jacob was jubilant. Esau was furious and so Jacob had to flee and it was many years before he was able to return to Canaan with his growing family and receive Esau's forgiveness and pardon. But when he came back and and settled in Canaan, Jacob continued to flourish. His family grew. He had 12 sons. Unfortunately, he had learned at his mother's knee that it was okay to have favourites. After all, it had served him well. Joseph, his 11th son, was his favourite and he encouraged him, he loved him and he lavished gifts on him in a way he didn't do with the others. That left Joseph as an outsider amongst his siblings But it seems as though he didn't really mind too much because, after all, it was him that got all the good gifts, including that famous coat of many colours. The brothers were jealous of Joseph, but there was more to it than that. They felt that Joseph looked down on them and demonstrated his disdain for them. He was a dreamer and he would share the dreams he'd had with them. Not least amongst those dreams was the one which we skipped over this morning when he dreamt that he and his brother were binding sheaves of corn when suddenly his sheaves stood upright and all the others bowed down to him. And then there was the one where the sun, the moon and the eleven stars all bowed down to him. Joseph's brother saw him as an arrogant boy who needed taken down a peg or two. So they took their chance, they captured him and then they sold him to travellers to be carted off to Egypt as a sail. And then they went back and told their father he'd been killed by a wild animal. Well, we know the story doesn't end there, but that's for another day. For the moment, we're left focusing on this mixed bunch of God's people. Yes, that's right. These are God's people. We may think that dysfunctional families are a modern invention, but they aren't. We may think that dysfunctional families are not the norm, but they are. In those four generations, we see poor parenting, favouritism, greed, jealousy, anger, pride, arrogance. This is where we've come from. So often we bemoan the fact that standards and values are so poor in our day, but it's actually always been the case. While I can recognise that these early ancestors of our faith heritage were just ordinary people with many faults and also many good points, the flaws still disappoint me. Because after all, they were God's people, called to live and to lead and to grow the family of God. Isn't it such a huge disappointment that they are such weak people? And then, when I have firmly placed my judgment hat on my head and realised that far from being righteous, they were a pretty ungodly bunch most of the time. 
that hat is sharply knocked off. And I'm reminded that no generation of God's people has been perfect. None have avoided sin. All have made mistakes. I'm reminded of my mum on an occasion when she was very angry with me for some long forgotten reason. And she said to me, you're not fit to be a minister. At the time, as you can imagine, those words stung. But you know, on reflection, I don't think she ever said a truer word to me. I'm not fit to be a minister or a follower of Christ, one of God's people. I don't deserve to be. I am not good enough, kind enough, faithful enough. I don't spend enough time praying or reading the Bible, doing good deeds or all the things I know would make me a more righteous person. I've done things I shouldn't and I've made mistakes I could have avoided. I've disappointed people who expected more of me. But I also know that over the years, at times the church has been very good at allowing people to become overwhelmed by guilt, bereft of self-confidence and the stories of our flawed ancestors actually give me hope. More than that, my hope is much greater than theirs could ever have been. Our righteousness before God isn't counted, is counted not from the mistakes, but from the times we've turned back to God, acknowledged our sins, accepted the forgiveness. If God could do so much with Abraham, who was so impatient for a son that he took God's promise and tried to make it happen in his time on his terms, what can he do with you and me? If he took the foolishness of generations of favouritism and transformed it into the knowledge that each one of us is loved equally by God, despite the unlovable traits the errors. If he took arrogance and pride and jealousy in Jacob's family and formed an entire nation that he called his, then he can certainly mould us. We can be certain that God can use us even if we're not fit for purpose because he is God and he's done it before with material that's just as weak, if not more so. And here is something even more incredible. In these people, we see God at work without Jesus. We sit at the opposite end of history, remembering where we've come from. And between those patriarchs and ourselves sits one who changed everything. Because in Christ, the barrier of sin came tumbling down. We are righteous because we are right with God in Christ. As those early people of God simply had to do their best and God would do the rest, so it is for us. We will never be perfect, never fit, but we can be in training. And the key to our training is very simple it's the simple truth that Paul offered to the church in Rome that was making faith such a complicated thing. Paul said, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved.
let us pray. Out of your providing, Lord, we make this offering brought from our daily living. Sanctify your gift and bless the life from which it comes, that with a cheerful spirit and an ungrudging heart, we may be devoted to your service through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let's come before God now with our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Lord of life, you've called us together in the name of Jesus Christ. In him and through him we praise you. For the gift of your Son, our Saviour, born a child, growing to maturity, teaching your truth, healing the sick, befriending sinners, crucified at Calvary, risen, ascended and with us forever. From our hearts we thank you. For all that you offer us through Christ, for the leading and strengthening of the Holy Spirit, for our baptism and growing in faith, for the nourishment of word and sacrament, for the fellowship of others in the church, living in this place and across the world. From our hearts we thank you. For those gifts of yours which make us what we are, for talents of mind and eye and hand, for every opportunity to be of service, for those who love us and cherish us, for those whom we value as neighbours and friends. From our hearts we thank you. Give us grace, we pray, to accept your gifts joyfully and to use them generously to your glory and praise. Gracious God, rejoicing in your blessings, trusting in your loving care for all, we bring you our prayers for the world. We pray for the created world, for those who rebuild where things have been destroyed, for those who fight hunger, poverty, disease, for those who have power to bring change for the better and to renew hope. In the life of our world, your kingdom come, O Lord, your will be done. We pray for our country, for our king and his family, for those who frame our laws and shape our common life, for those who keep the peace and administer justice, for those who teach, those who heal, all who serve the community. In the life of our land, your kingdom come, O Lord. Your will be done. We pray for people in need. For those for whom life is a bitter struggle. Those whose lives are clouded by death or loss, by pain or disability, by discouragement or fear, by shame or rejection. In the lives of those in need, your kingdom come, O Lord. Your will be done. We pray for those in the circle of friendship and love around us. Children and parents, sisters and brothers, friends and neighbours, and for those especially in our thoughts today. In the lives of those we love, your kingdom come, O Lord, your will be done. We pray for the church in its stand with the poor, in its love for the outcast and the ashamed, in its service to the sick and the neglected, in its proclamation of the gospel in this land, in this place. In the life of your church, your kingdom come, O Lord, your will be done. Eternal God, we give thanks to you for the great community of faith into which you brought us. For those who have kept safe our scriptures, gathered our songs, built our sanctuaries and taught us to know and trust you. 
Grant us grace in our day to live as faithfully as they did and to provide as generously for our children until you bring us with all your people into the fullness of your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all praise and glory forever. Amen. Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with you now and always. <laughs>